<clears throat> so good morning. Happy Friday. Um, getting there, right? Three more weeks after after this week, right? 14, 15, 16. Woohoo! So you guys are doing great. Um, does anybody have questions about um, about anything, about any of the courses, about skills, about uh, theory, anything? We can go ahead and answer answer those. I know I spoke with you um, yesterday, Mrs. Solinger, about some of the hours. Um, mm -hmm. I verified with Dr. Shepard. I thought she was in charge of all the hours, but she referred me mm -hmm. to, to ask other people. So who else am I asking as far as making sure that my hours are all on point? Me. You? OK. Fantastic. I'll send you I think, and I thought I responded back because she copied me on the email you had sent her. You did. But I just wanted to be a little more specific with you. So yes, and and I am happy to meet with anybody um, one on one or in small groups or whatever. If you want to run your hours uh, by me, perfect. That's Thanks that's so fine. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. When can we expect the study uh, guide for the final? You know that is a good question. I will uh, speak with the other faculty and find out um because the final would be on the monday of week 16 so that'd be kind of nice to get that out to you um yeah we'll make it well i'll move it up well it's it, we'll, i'll talk to the rest of the faculty make sure we get moving on that in fact let me even write that. and it is monday the 17th of may correct i think i saw it somewhere incorrect i want to say it was on the syllabus it said monday the 16th oh oops Got my so April, May. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. It should be, yes, the 17th, um, which is a Monday. And it will be uh, at the regular, regularly scheduled time, the 11 a.m. Um, and then you'll have a clinical on Tuesday and Wednesday. The e portfolios are due on Wednesday, the 19th. Your skills final exam is on the 20th, Thursday, and uh, you have that information. And then the um, concepts to uh, proctored assessment will be on uh, Friday the 21st, and that's at eight o'clock so that we can get you through it and you can enjoy the rest of your day. And the- um, Yes, ma'am. Uh, what's the point breakdown for the skills final, like for each skill and then for the uh, documentation? That is another good question. Um, Mr. Espinas and I are working on that right now. Um, I believe it's 100 points total, if I recall correctly. Um, and so the um, we're going to probably try and, and break it up so that everything's pretty much even or the skill would count a little bit more than the documentation. I think we did 20 points each. For the doc or 20 points for the documentation um, last semester, but we'll get that uh, we'll get that out to you as well. Let me make myself a note on that as well. Um, okay, thank you. Skills final points breakdown. Um, because what we're going to do is is like we did last semester, where the skill will have the um, the checklist, you know, the basic uh, key pieces for the skills and then we'll, we'll get those out to you. We just haven't, I haven't put those together yet. So um, we'll get that out to you. Okay. And then what else? And then your community paper is due on the 10th by midnight. Your presentations um, are on the 14th. Next week, right? Uh, Friday is your farm final. And what else? And then, and then your clinical uh, paperwork. Right. Okay. Um, I believe registration for um, fall uh, has started to open. Correct. And so for. Um, or at least for some students, I know it's kind of like a rolling 
uh, way that that, that, that happens. Um, and so you would be registering for uh, NRN 66, which is the third semester um, that contains the theory component and the clinical component, just like 46 and 56. That is the only course. There's not a farm, there's not a skills you know, required uh, course. And so um, you're just signing up for that. Having said that, um, when students were signing up for the sections yesterday, it, it's sort of a blind sign up because there's no instructor, there's no times, um, that type of thing. And so um, there weren't enough sections, right? There were, there was four sections, five sections, but only seven could sign up. So that's only 35 students. So I spoke with Belinda and what were, um, what I believe she was working on today was to make it four sections of nine, so that's 36, with a fifth section of six students, because you will be at, you'll be a class of 42, because you have two students that will be coming in with you. Um, so you'll be a class of 42. Those six students will be in a section that, um, because you guys haven't had this had this before, Dr. Whitmore and Mrs. Thorpe are will be able to do Sims again, like interprofessional Sims and Sims like Dr. Whitmore is doing right now. And so there's a section in order for her to get a clinical load, we have to give her some students. And so six students would be put into that section, whichever section has the six students, and then those students would then get divvied out to the other um, to the other four sections. So with that information, you guys can work it out amongst yourselves however you wanna, wanna do it. Um, again, no guarantees. I don't think there's a PM section, but don't quote me on that. I, I, I asked the question last night and um, again, based on not knowing what SVMH and Nativitat are going to be able to, uh, the placements are going to be able to give us, we're really not able to give you an answer to that question, um, but hopefully that information helps you. Um, you will be able to sign up for um, NRN, um, the success, which is 227, right? 227. 227. I believe Ms. Diamond is teaching that um, from what I understand. Uh, when you sign up for that, it may tell you that you haven't met a prerequisite because we haven't been able to change it to the new curriculum prerequisite yet. So what we will do is we will talk to um, Dr. Estrella, uh, the counselor who can do a, a pre or co-requisite waiver, right? So if you, if you wanna be in success with Mrs. Diamond, we can make that happen, right? So don't panic if it says like, you can't sign up because you didn't meet the, the co or the prereq or whatever. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, okay. Um, I'm getting to that, Emily. Good, good segue. Thank you. So it won't let you sign up for open lab either because um, I don't, okay, let's see. I don't know if the success class is mandatory again. Um, I've not heard that it is. I think you will find that um, it will be helpful for you to have Miss Diamond because it's her, it's her wheelhouse, right? This is the stuff that, that she knows and you've seen her in farm. You know, like I can't speak high, highly enough. Um, no, we will have open skills lab. I spoke with her last night. Um, because what will happen is because open it's it's all technical paperwork stuff. So open skills lab, what will most likely happen is you will have to register for 50.41 because the 50.43 currently doesn't, it has a um, you have to be enrolled in 43, and we don't have 43 anymore. So what we do for that one is you register for 50.41 and then um, that says or approval of the dean and then we just have the dean approve everybody that wants to take it and then you can you can get into the open skills lab. And I just got all of that information yesterday. I worked on all of that uh, yesterday. I think that was the third thing I was doing at the same time yesterday. <laughs> um, so, so we, ha we have that covered, just be patient. We'll try and keep you posted. Um, I did let Mrs. Davis know, so, um, uh, so she's aware, right? So I answered all that, right? So, um, so just be patient with open lab. We'll figure out a way to get you all in there. We would probably just do like a blanket who wants to sign up and then the Dean will approve it and you guys will be fine um, with that. 
I've not heard if success is mandatory. Again, um, for students that came into second semester, it was mandatory because you were coming into the program. So I don't think it would necessarily be mandatory for third semester. I would, however, say, you know, if you feel like you need the help and you're still struggling with a lot of things, then I think it would be good for you to, um, to take the course. We are looking at, um, I don't want to say this, making it more student friendly, if that makes sense. Um, and so I know um, that I will I will work with Mrs. Davis because I'm teaching success for first semester. I have 225. And so um, I think we're really looking to make it as as student friendly as possible in terms of like assignments and, and things that we're looking at. We want we want you to be successful. And so my personal opinion uh, is there's a better way we can do the course to, to make that happen for you. Um, so does that help with signing up? for things? Uh, Amanda, yes, ma'am. I have a random question about the growth and development course this summer. Yes. <laughs> um, I know somebody who's gonna be teaching it. Yes, um, me too. Is, <laughs> and I have a summer job lined up. So I was wondering if you knew what days those were gonna be on yet and uh, how long the lectures are going to be? So um, generally speaking, uh, for that class over the summer, um, it's been a six week class. I think now they've made it an eight week course. Um, it is an open educational resources course. So there is no textbook. Um, it is a distance education course. So I have not um, in the past done specific lectures that you are required to attend. I am considering for the summer to do some, to do some um, sessions like that, that would be recorded, but it would be completely asynchronous. That's awesome, thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, if anybody needs three units and, and wants a DE over the summer course, I always plug my own course, because um, I teach it over the summer and uh, growth and development. Um, and it's, yeah, you, you do the work. John, yeah, it's, thank you, John. <laughs> Yeah, John and Armel took it last summer, so they've taken the, the condensed one, so um, I think it's pretty good. Uh, all right, what other what other questions or things? <laughs> Thank Kenya, you. Uh, Ken, Kenya had a question up there. I don't know if it was answered. I'm, I'm sorry, I had to step away. Oh, for, for the skills, for the open skills lab? No, the PICO presentations. Oh, gosh, sorry. I, missed, I, I went right past that one. Where was it? Oh, okay. PICO presentations in person. Um, so the, the PICO presentations are your either PowerPoint or which Prezi or a video or whatever that are being uploaded. So students will have an opportunity to look at them ahead of time. And then that way we can have a discussion about them. And if, if we need to pull up the presentation, I can do that on the, um, on the big screen, you know, in Skills Lab. Right, and then we can go through them, or people can can talk about them. The point was sort of to, because um, it's sort of the last class kind of thing, um, and that's week fifteen, because we're going to do reconstitution, and I think you guys wanted what was on my list, intradermal. So we'll add intradermal in there to the reconstitution review that. Um, but it's basically to hang out and talk about the process and what you learned. So, so you wouldn't technically have to get up in front of anybody and present um, because you should all be able to go into um, the shared drive. But um, I can double check the link and then maybe Hugo or somebody can let me know if the link works to get in there. People have been um, downloading or uploading, uploading their presentations and I've been dropping them in the shared drive. Um, but I'm, I'm maybe Hugo, you and I can work on that to make sure I have the link right. And because you should be able to just drop it into the into the shared drive. But I can't remember where I put the link. So <laughs> I'll have to post the link again. Does that does that help? It's, it's, it's basically hang out and talk about stuff and what you've learned and how you've grown. Because boy, are you guys growing? It's impressive. I had the I had the pleasure of being at uh, at in Casterville yesterday. And uh, it was just amazing to watch everybody. It was really cool. Um. <laughs> 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 
Me either, Kelly. I think I'm shrinking. <laughs> okay, what else? Anything else before we before we get moving on here? Oh, thank you, Hugo. So if I understand correctly, <laughs> oh, good job, Roberto. <laughs> Yeah, that should be the link to the Pico Drive, right? And they should be able to, everybody should just be able to go there, right? And then, and upload. Okay, cool. <laughs> you guys are funny. Um, all righty. So, hearing no objections, um, let me do this. Share my screen yet again. And we are, uh, let's see, right? You can see the week 13 overview. Yes, no. Kelly, you're the only, yes, thank yeah. you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so you work on that course evaluation, please. Um, I'd appreciate that. Um, this is the link to the lesson, which we'll go to in a second. We're talking today, it's, it's almost kind of a recap, but we're going to add some new exemplars in. Um, some of these I added in, um, like I added a little bit about the fractures in there because that'll be on the level two concepts. We actually had a great meeting, um, Ms. Cousineau and I, with, um, with ATI to figure out how to maybe make it align a little bit better. Um, probably not gonna happen for a while, but, um, but we appreciate your, your patience with that. Um, and so we're talking about mobility in terms of um, more like pediatric exemplars, like the um, developmental hip dysplasia, uh, club foot, um, the, the hip, you know, hips and kind of looking at that throughout the lifespan, as well as um, cerebral palsy is going to be one of the big, um, the, one of the, the focus for today. Um, and if you remember when we were talking about Down syndrome, those babies tend to be kind of floppy. Right. And so the muscle tone um, in terms of right. Remember, have we talked about having to feed the baby and having to support the head and the jaw and and uh, and doing some physical therapy type things. So we're going to uh, talk about cerebral palsy a little bit, talk about some different gait issues or what you would you would see. Um, and then briefly talk about some pharmacolog pharmacological therapy, surgical procedures, and then spend time on um, on. Um, like the care plan for when the child is is home or in school or uh, what you would do, you know, how those are all compared and contrasted hospital community school. Um, and so your readings were to review, right? Cause we covered functional ability last semester and we did um, development, I believe in week two of this semester. And then you had your ATI readings to do. Um, and so uh, we're gonna do some case studies here. Let me go to the lesson page. Same thing. And so what, oh, I didn't even change that up. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so what I did is I posted functional ability from last semester. That's the PowerPoint that we had last semester. So if, if people weren't here, they have that available to them. And then um, uh, let me keep that open. Um, Oh, sorry, ABGs. Uh, yeah, that's a Mrs. Diamond thing. Um, and then um, this link takes you back to week two. So those are your references from um, for those two those two concepts, functional ability and development. And then uh, um, there's some links here, some pictures when you're talking about cerebral palsy. Um, there's different types of cerebral palsy. Let's go ahead. We can do that. Where are we on time? Okay. Oops, let's do it this way. Um, has anybody cared for a patient with cerebral palsy? Or have like an experience to share? When I, when I work, go ahead. I hear somebody. Is that you, Emily? Oh yeah, I was just gonna say um, at the therapeutic writing center where I volunteered at, we um, had a girl who came through her like middle like middle school and high school years who had cerebral palsy 
and they kind of told her that it was um like happened at something that like occurred at birth for her and she was in a wheelchair but we would do a lot of like stretches with her and help her get on the horse and like do stretches on there and so you could kind of see the progression of her body motion and changing and stuff um and for the most part she was pretty mentally there like I don't know that she was necessarily up to grade level but she would have conversations she wanted to talk about boys you know she was very much wanted to just be like any other normal teenager um but you know she definitely had a lot of difficulties with her her body and her bowels and stuff and that's part of why she came to do the therapeutic riding is because it actually helps like stimulate bowel movement mm -hmm. um so that was really cool to kind of see those changes in her over a couple of years was she do you know was she more spastic and with contractures or uh, yeah she had a lot of contractures um in her upper body and so she would hold her arms kind of like you were just holding them but we were able to kind of work with her and then over time she could hold on to the like the vaulting sir single herself and it started out where we would ride behind her and kind of basically support her entire body weight and then we kind of got to the point where um we would just need like sidewalkers and a leader and stuff like that um and to kind of just be safe so i don't know she's probably there four or five years she'd come once a week wow. um, until her family ended up moving to southern california um but it was definitely i think she really enjoyed it and you could see the changes in her contractures and in her strength do you know awesome. if she had a do you know if she had a baclofen pump a what a baclofen pump it'd be no i don't think she did okay because we'll talk a little bit about about baclofen because that helps with the spasticity um this was maybe 15 years ago though so i don't know if that's something they did then it was, well, let's see do, do, do. Yeah, it was kind of newer. Certain places do it and certain places weren't at that point. So, but that's amazing. Like, it's amazing to see the progress, right? Even just a once a week type of thing is, is amazing. Um, and so uh, generally uh, considered not a birth defect, it's not congenital necessarily, um, but generally happens at birth from anoxia, lack of oxygen. And so mobility is a big, uh, piece of this, which is why we're talking about it today under mobility, is because, um, as Emily was saying, there can be, con you can have uh, someone who's very contracted um, and very spastic, and then you can also have um, where there's not flaccid necessarily, there's tone, um, but it's loose, loose, or there's not control. So there's sort of this sort of spastic movement or, or repetitive kind of movements um, that, that, that they have no control over. Um, and so there are different therapies. I love the horse therapy type of thing and, um, different walking implements. They're doing some muscle strengthening with the, the bike walker, um, which is kind of cool. Um, which I think, which is interesting. And then, um, so again, usually from hypoxia or asphyxia. So I think this is also a nice, um, crossover to maternity for this semester because, those have not, I don't think everybody's actually been in a delivery yet, but this is one of the reasons why it's so important when we see the heart rate dropping, right? Or when we're, we're in those situations when the mom's in labor, because this is, this is, is a, it can be a problem, right? If we don't intervene, if we don't have certain, you know, take certain um, precautions, then oftentimes, not often, sometimes there can be asphyxia, um, or hypoxia. So hypoxia, low oxygen, asphyxia, asphyxia no oxygen. Um, and, and this would be the, the result. Sometimes there's not an identifiable immediate cause, but eventually um, you find it. And so um, generally the anoxia is the most common cause. Um, and then the different types we talked about, we were talking about spastic, which is the increased muscle tone. Um, there's also the um, dyskinetic type, which is um, the uncontrolled movements or inability really to relax a muscle. And then there's more ataxic. So the, um, the picture of the boy with the, the canes that was walking, that's more of an ataxic, a balance and coordination type. And then with mixed type, you can have combinations of, of all the types. Um, you can also have, in terms of the spastic cerebral palsy, these dif different difficulties, you can have sort of a um, 
tetraparesis, a quadriparesis, so not a plesia, but a paresis, a weakness. Um, and so the um, it's not just the big muscles of the arms and legs, it's, it's speech um, and swallowing, all those things that we we're talking about with the nutrition and, and being careful um, of how you're feeding uh, the patient or, um, you know, and then I think all the psychosocial, emotional um, aspects of it for the patient as well as, as the family. Um, so what you might be looking for, it may not be readily apparent at birth. So things that you would look for, again, looking back at those developmental milestones, right? We've talked about knowing, you know, in general, those developmental milestones so that if the child isn't meeting those, right, then you can be, oh, we need further investigation. We need to look and see if there's a problem. So poor head control, the stiff or rigid limbs, um, sometimes the arching back or pushing away. That doesn't mean every baby that does that has cerebral palsy. That's just on the list of things to, to investigate further. If they're unable to sit without support by eight months, um, if they continue to clench their fists after three months, because they should be able to, to open and, and close. Um, other behaviors, you know, no smiling, the feeding difficulties, perhaps excessive irritability, gagging and choking. Um, just because like Emily was saying, just because you have cerebral palsy doesn't mean that the IQ is low, um, but it's really difficult to, um, to figure out if the, if Emily, if the, if the girl, um, how old did you say she was 15? Yeah. I want to say she started coming when she was like in middle school and then was there maybe halfway through high school. Um, she was and, probably only actually a year or two younger than myself at the time. Oh, okay. Uh, probably, where would where would you say she was then, um, uh, IQ wise or mentally or? Because you said she had conversations and yeah, she was maybe what one or two grade levels lower. I think she did. She like was an Aptos High student and like junior high student. So she did have like some of like the special classes or her like aids or stuff. But like, I don't know that she would have necessarily been doing good, like great in like high level science or math classes, but she was probably at like, you know, if you think about like hundred percent of students, she was probably at the like the 30% line or like, you know, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it was probably hard to gauge because we didn't always talk about school type stuff. Right. No, that's okay. But, um, but know, it wasn't one of those things where I felt like, you know, she was, you know, five or six grade levels below or something. So like she was that. pretty close to age appropriate. We would say age appropriate. Um, I think so. You're pretty close. And yeah. it's, it's difficult to assess depending on the setting. You, you are correct. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about school settings as well in a little bit. And then looking at the feeding, having to support, um, you know, jaw control. Um, a lot of, when I was doing home care uh, many moons ago, I, I took care of a lot of children that had um, cerebral palsy and the muscle issues were, were huge. And so many of the, the, um, the children actually had G-tubes, either Mickey buttons or, or gastric tubes um, so that we didn't have to worry about the, the choking and the, the aspiration. So that's, that also segues in, you know, into what you're doing in, in skills as well. Um, and well, so can I ask an unrelated question about NG tubes? Sure. JJ. Um, uh, last day, the last clinical day, um, I was in the pediatric unit mm -hmm. and we were talking about different NG tubes and I was asking, you know, about differences in placing it with children versus adults. Mm -hmm. And the nurse I was with said, oh, we never use x-ray to confirm placement. Mm -mm. And so I was very surprised by that response um, because that had been so emphasized in class. Mm -hmm. And so I was, that surprised me and I was wondering if that was the hospital policy or if there was you know, more variation with that. So we did kind of talk about that a little bit in, um, in class. We remember you guys did that um, like research kind of thing about what is the best practice to check for placement and although x-ray is, is probably the, de the definitive one, like we put NG tubes in neonates, um, like those of you that have been in NICU, right? Th those babies almost all have NG tubes, the ones that are really preemie. And uh, we don't verify that with, with x-ray. That's basically placement. And if we're getting gastric contents back, 
because they tend to pull them out so often um, and the amount of radiation that you would be giving that newborn, um, that would be a lot of radiation to be getting for, for the x-ray. Um, in adults, it's a little bit easier to check that placement and it's a little more, um, it's longer, right? That you're trying to insert the tube. Um, should we check with x-ray? Well, like peds, we don't generally check with x-ray. It's usually the aspiration or if they have pH paper. Um, but that's why this has been a huge push in some hospitals to do the pH paper, like to have something other than aspiration or not, well, aspiration or um, auscultation be the standard. So I'm not saying they're right or wrong, but that it's probably the, the standard at the hospital. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Yeah, I, yeah. It, should we probably, but again, I don't know how often you want to um, be x-raying uh, the ch a child, especially. Um, and a lot of times, if it's going to be something that's chronic, um, they will go ahead and put a G-tube in if, or a Mickey button in eventually, but for short term, probably not. But that's a great question. Um, so this gives you a definition. There's a, a website called Caring for Special Needs Children that has different um, uh, examples of cerebral palsy. Uh, here's a nice little picture I thought of uh, the different types of cerebral palsy. So that would be good to know. Um, there's a link here to um, the CDC in talking about it lists different types and different um, like some treatments and different resources. I, I didn't really realize the CDC had like all these different, you know, for like almost any diagnosis. It was kind of cool. Um, and then I will say I do have a bias uh, towards Shriners Hospital because I did work there. I actually worked at the um, Sacramento one when it first opened. I was the um, nursing super nursing house supervisor, and then I went on to be the nursing director for the adolescent unit, which was mostly a spinal cord unit. Um, but we did also have a lot of children with cerebral palsy. And so when you're talking about therapies, I think this is a very good um, team approach to how they do this. They treat um, a lot of different um, orthopedic um, issues, you know, scoliosis, they'll put rods in or they'll do um, fusion, spinal fusions. They do um, all kinds of serial casting. They'll do, if there's different growth disorders, they'll do different, um, which we'll talk about different um, external fixators for all these different things. They're actually a center of excellence for cerebral palsy. Um, they were one of the first um, I don't, hospital centers that actually was doing baclofen pump trials. So it was kind of nice to sort of be um, involved at the in the beginning of that and to actually see um, how well it worked for some, not for all, but for the ones that it worked for, it was amazing to just watch them be able to, to move and the asbestos, the rigidity go away um, with that. So um, they do a lot of research there. And uh, so if you have, um, you know, if you have questions or if you want, if you're interested, look at the video, um, PT, OT, ST, all work together. It's a very, um, when we talk about care conferences, like Shriners is, is it like you're all, we all were in a room and we had, you know, nutrition, PT, OT, ST, doctors, nurses, and the nurses actually presented the patient, which was kind of cool um, and gave all the information and made the recommendations. Um, and so they have different, you know, success stories. So I just think that's an option. Shriners is, um, is free care. To, to the best of my knowledge, still remains free care. It used to be where you had to have a Shriner that was um, your sponsor, but that was a long, long time ago. Now that doesn't, you don't have to have that. Um, and so I, just, I really can't say enough about it. I think it was a great place to work um, and it's a really good resource there. I believe are still 23 across the country. They don't all take care of all of the um, disease processes. Shriner Sacramento is the flagship in terms of taking burns and ortho um, and spinal cord injury. And they've also expanded um, the cerebral palsy piece of it. Um, the one in Portland does cleft palate. My son went there. Um, so really in terms of rehab um, and uh, helping with school, like they have their own teachers there, right, to help the, the, the children stay up with schoolwork if they need, um, or to work with them, and also to help with transition to school, to work with the individualized education plans, the IEPs and the, the 504s and the different things that you need um, 
uh, like uh, Emily was saying in the special ed classrooms, right? You'll have special ed, um, the classrooms and it's, it's really nice. JJ, did you have a question? No? Um, uh, no, not right now. Okay, which is your box lit up. So sometimes that means somebody's trying to talk. Uh, free and think the care isn't going to be. Oh, true, right. Um, thank you, Kelly. Um, yeah, uh, were you were at you were at Shriners for the. I am in contact with a lot of families that have gone to Shriners. We did not take Willow to Shriners. We were we were sent to a different place that was fine. Um, but yeah, I hear only good things about Shriners. Even you know, a lot of people will be um, recommended to go there by other families and parents, etc. Even after they've received. Um, not so great care at other hospitals mm -hmm. um so yeah i just i know that they are very highly regarded in the clubfoot world at least i can't really mm -hmm. speak anything else but yeah thank you um and we're gonna talk so we're gonna move move on from there into some other um brittle bone disease osteogenesis imperfecta oi as it's known um, and so, or also as brittle bone disease, just so that you're aware of it. These children often, if you don't know that they have osteogenesis imperfecta, these children will come in with serial fractures, like re repeat fractures. And so what, um, what might that lead people to think? That there is abuse in the household. That there might be abuse, Aaron. Is that what you were thinking? Yeah, that's what I was saying, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, um, and that's not necessarily the case. And so then you're gonna do bone density studies and do x-rays um, to see what's going on. Um, you can also have different types of um, the scoliosis or kyphosis with the, with the spine. Um, there is no cure specifically for osteogenesis imperfecta. You can manage the symptoms, you can um, treat the broken bones. Um, there are some therapies, you know, pain medications, good, good nutrition. Um, the children, I don't know the life expectancy. It's not, um, it's, I don't think it's, I, I actually don't know what it is. Um, I've, I've seen children. There are some adults that, that people that live into adulthood, the same with cerebral palsy. Um, people live into adulthood, or if there's anoxia, then you can get cerebral palsy as an adult as well. Um, I'm trying to think, what was that? Oh yeah, Mr. Glass. That I'm like, what? That's what Amanda's talking about. Yeah, Mr. Glass. I'm like, wait, what was that movie? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then um, different types of traction. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, the fractures, but there's these are some pictures of different types of traction. Um, I found a little uh, mnemonic here about looking at traction. So we actually talked about traction when we talked about what last week or the week before? Spinal injury. Yeah, spinal injury, right? Because they have the halo traction, right? And, you, and so it keeps, the, it keeps the, the neck in place and the spinal uh, column in place, yes. Good job, Ormel. Um, And so that's skeletal traction. You also have something called skin uh, traction to reduce spasms or to maintain the immobilization. Um, skeletal traction at is attaching directly to the bone and you get a pull. Usually there's there can be weights or, or there may not be. Um, some of the key things are you're looking at um, the temperature, right? Because you've got skin integrity issues. And so then you could therefore have infection, right? That could uh, follow. You wanna make sure that the, um, the ropes are always hanging freely. Like that's one of the key things is you don't want the rope caught on something or the weight caught on something. The, the rope must hang freely. Um, and making sure that it's in alignment that somehow the leg or whichever part hasn't moved. So you wanna make sure that the alignment's good. Um, doing circulation checks, we'll talk about those a little bit. Um, the trapeze, the little triangle thing to help mobilize, right? People can pull themselves to help reposition because we want to promote independence as much as possible, right? Um, fluids, oftentimes they'll have a Foley or we'll do bedpan because they're not going anywhere if they're on traction. So if they're, if they're in, in traction, what are, what are some things that you're worried about? What are things that are priority assessments to do?
Skin? Skin. Skin is one, yes. Breakdown, other contractures. Other contractures, yep. Mm-hmm. Monitor skin, repositioning. Mm -hmm. Fluid and electrolyte nutrition. Yeah. All right. Sheer boredom. Pardon? Sheer boredom. Yes. <laughs> So with kids, hopefully, if they're in a pediatric hospital, then you've got your activities director, your recreation therapist, and you've got the school teacher there that can help, you know, uh, not not be so bored. But otherwise, yeah. And so with boredom, what what can eventually happen if you're in traction for a couple of weeks and you're bored? Especially with COVID, not having a lot of visitors, if any. Depression. Depression. Right. So being on alert for that, getting support systems, support services for that, assessing for that, um, all very important. And then when you're, so that's immobility, you're not because we're trying to look at these in terms of, of mobility. So um, the same thing with the cerebral palsy and, and the mobility, you're looking at the skin integrity, you're looking at nutrition, just the same type of things. When we look at moving on now, we're gonna talk a little bit about the congenital or developmental hip dysplasia. So um, this is a kind of interesting video. It's actually shot from the terms of the physician who's assessing the baby. Um, and he actually kind of shows you how he looks and does the, the list is feeling for the, the hip clicks. Um, so I thought that was, that was a good one. Um, it, congenital means that they're born with it. Developmental could be something that, because you could develop it at any stage. And as you get into, as you move into adult and geriatric, you're going to end up with, with hip problems as well. So that, and you're gonna talk about those in third semester. Um, we're focusing more on the child in, um, in second semester, but you still have the same sort of mobility issues. So in a child that has, if the, if the hip dysplasia wasn't, caught. For, well, first of all, let's go back. Hip dysplasia. What does hip dysplasia mean? The hips aren't aligned or maybe it's popped out. Mm -hmm. And so what do, you, what do you mean by popped out? That's correct. Like the ball isn't in the socket? Correct. Mm -hmm. And that's why you get the click, right? So if the ball's in the socket and it's moving, you're not going to get a click. But if it's out and you move and it hits it, you're going to get the click. Right. And so um, what if that went undetected again for, for anybody, what kind of mobility issues might you see? They might not be able to crawl or walk when they get older. Um, they're going to have pain all the time Maybe just crying all the time if they're an infant. Mm -hmm. Especially a baby that cries all the time. That's that would always be um, an in, a red flag for me, a baby that was inconsolable. Mm -hmm. it can, um, it, they can have like further, um, like if it's not caught as well, um, it can kind of cause further delay too, like with um, or further issues later on, right, in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 Amanda, Amanda, right, delayed milestones. So again, we're going back to that developmental piece of why it's so important to understand when the children reach these certain milestones. We're looking more in terms of if they haven't reached them, we need to do further investigation. But this is, this is for example, why, um, and, I th and I think you guys are well aware of this, but like at Clinica, when the MAs are doing the assessments, they're just going down the list. And if a parent says that the child hasn't necessarily reached that milestone, um, the MAs just keep going through the checklist. So we're hoping, we're keeping our fingers crossed that when they get that information to the physician, um, that the physician will see that, or the care provider, sorry, will see, will see that and, and go further, talk further to the, patient, the parent, or that the parent will mention it to the physician. What, what potentially is wrong with that picture? Miscommunication, um, like maybe the MA doesn't report it or the physician doesn't follow up and ask the questions themselves. Exactly, which a delay in care, exactly. And that's why I think, um, I think it's so important for nursing, for nurses 
to be doing those developmental screenings and why we, we talk so much about it initially is so that we can also teach um, the parents to look for these things, right? Because the parent is with the um, with the child all the time. So we used to do, when we can still do the Denver developmental assessments, but, um, but those have to be done by a professional. If we go by the Bright Futures, for example, all those little handouts and we're giving that education to the parent, then they, if they see something that's not quite right, then hopefully they're on the phone. Well, the, my handout says, or the doctor told me and my child isn't doing this. Um, and then hopefully they can come in for follow-up, for follow-up, um, which is good. Now, when you have congenital hip dysplasia, this baby in this particular video has a mild case of hip dysplasia. I don't know if anybody's um, seen or had a child or, you know, has anything to share. That's, that would, um, is certainly welcome. Um, but you have a couple different ways to keep the hip in a position to where it's going to grow uh, appropriately. So if we're looking at the ball and socket to stay the way we need it to stay, which is kind of more lightweight, no, that way. Um, how, do we how do we keep the baby's legs in that position? Well, one of the ways um, is the Pavlik harness because this gentleman named Pavlik uh, figured out how to make this happen. It's not casting, it's not a cast. So I think that's one of the major pluses of the Pavlik uh, harness is that it's, it's kind of like a vest sort of thing that you wear and you can see where the, um, how it's uh, positioned here to keep the uh, legs at that 90-ish degree angle so that the, it, grows, it grows the way that it's supposed to, to go. Does that make sense? And so this is, this is a little bit easier. You can take this off, you can bathe the child, you can, it's, it's a lot easier. But if it's a really bad dysplasia, um, then you might be looking at doing a spica cast um, or the Pavlik is generally for a baby. Whereas if there's a, a developmental hip dysplasia for children at older ages, you're going to do the spica cast. Those are a pain in the behind literally to care for. Um, they come in different sizes, shapes. You can have where it's um, both legs here with a bar across. You can have where it's one full and one half with, with bar or no bar. You can have where it's just one leg. There's many different combinations, but you can see it goes all the way up. This is an adult, but it goes all the way up the, the chest. You do have a cutout to be able to, um, to urinate and have bowel movements, uh, but what, what are you at risk for? What would the patient potentially be at risk for? Skin breakdown. Skin breakdown, right? It's, it's, it's difficult to clean the area uh, well sometimes. Um, I mean, even inside the cast, yes. you, know, you sweat, you move, you're rubbing. Um, and then when they get out of them, their skin's really, 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 really sensitive afterwards um mm -hmm. and i would think that it would be the same for this type of cast as it was for the club foot casting um for with willow we had to change it not only mm -hmm. to change the position but we had to change it to um compensate for rapid growth in babies yes and I, I, I have a too tight yeah i have a picture of that coming up yes and the spica cast would be the same thing depending um, on the growth rate, so the age and the growth rate of the of the child. And so what assessment that the nurse would do is, is very important. Weight, height at every appointment. Right, to, to know that circulation, yes. So yes, so you wanna look at the growth of the child, Kelly, yes, for sure. And then, um, uh, CSM, CM, whatever acronym, how you want to, how you want to say it, the circulation, sensation, and motion, CMS checks, circulation, motion, sensation, um, and temperature, or, and temperature, mm -hmm, are important because if they're, if they're not having some sensation, um, or they they stop, move, yeah, there you go, CMST, um, then that's a red flag. There's something called compartment syndrome sometimes where, where it swells. And so people tend to want to stick what the, uh, 
I don't even know if we have wire hangers anymore, but they stick things down the cast. Are you supposed to do that? No, 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 no. Um, so what are, what are some things for cast care? Um, this video talks a little bit about the spica cast care um, and like how to diaper or put um, like depends if it's an, an older adult and how to um, how to keep the uh, the cast clean the person clean. What about other people that have had casts or know people that have had cast had casts? What are some um, recommendations or things that have worked to decrease the the itching or discomfort? Ooh, moleskin's a good one. Yeah, the five Ps, exactly, Brittany. Moleskin is amazing. I love moleskin. It's a, it's a good thing. Keeping it cool, staying cool, sometimes that will help because like Kelly was saying, you sweat, you potentially sweat a lot. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if they would recommend that, uh, but I, I like fans, <laughs> fans are always good. Um, but keeping it clean, uh, especially with this type of cast and then wearing a bag when you shower for the casts. Yep. You can put a, a bag over, like if it's an arm cast, it's, it's hard to do it in the spica cast. So you're doing bed baths, right? You've got to, to wipe the, wipe them down. Um, and then what does this do for the mobility, right? There's, there's basically just upper mobility. If you're in a, in a double spica cast, it's, it's upper mobility. Now the bones are growing, which is nice. But what's going to have to happen after the cast comes off? Lots of physical therapy. Right, you're going to see multi, right muscle atrophy, multiple types of physical therapy, range of motion, right? Exactly. So it's there's a lot of rehab that goes along with that. Um, so club foot, uh, like Kelly was saying earlier. Um, oh, there we go. Okay, so uh, club foot. Um, Kelly was talking about the series, it's called serial because you're doing multiple castings. And as the baby grows, the casts get, um, have to be uh, probably longer and a bigger diameter, um, circumference, diameter, diameter and circumference, um, because you're doing different positionings to get the foot to straighten out. There's also um, this type of device that has the little uh, shoes. So you're basically keeping, you're not casting, so it's a less invasive and you can change the position of the shoe so that it, the, and the muscles to get it into the correct position. You have to be corrected before you get put in the braces. So you have- Oh, really? To okay. First. Yes. That's to hold correction while they're growing. Gotcha. Yeah, but Thank you have Thank you for the clarification. First. You're welcome. Awesome. I was looking at, and I couldn't find anything on it. I'm like, but it already looks like it's corrected. They had a couple ones that I found where the foot was still, um, turned a little bit. So that's why I was kind of confused with that. Cause these ones are definitely flat, but the other pic couple pictures that I saw the foot was turned. So that's why it didn't, I wasn't that's quite sure. Weird. That's that. kind of weird. I, I'm curious which ones, which ones they were, which. I, I, yeah, I'd weird. have to, yeah. I have to go look, I'd have to go back and look. Um, and you can also do, um, you can shorten or lengthen ligaments. So we do this in for cerebral palsy as well. It's not just club foot. It's it's any type of um, ligaments or tendons. You can do tendon lengthening, um, which if you lengthened a tendon or lengthened a ligament, what would that what would that do for the patient? Easier to move it. Mm -hmm. They have more length on it, so they can, yeah. yeah. Um, and those are actually quite successful. The ones that I've seen, Shriners does a lot of those. Um, and they're all pretty darn successful. And then let me go through this one. And then um, there's no quiz for this weekend um, and there's no uh, assignment per se. So uh, that's nice. Um, the week 14 quiz would be the in-class group quiz, which would be Monday because I'm teaching Monday and I believe Dr. Whitmore is Friday. And so um, that will be on the um, on seizures, and I have that. Um, I'll get that posted hopefully by tonight, um, and we can spend some time on that on Monday, just just so you understand and uh, have that in your head for what we're going to do on Monday. Um, and so, just a brief overview of the skeletal system, um, and things to know is that you know pediatric differences 
ch children, uh, when things are uh, like broken, like children heal faster. It's easier for them to, to heal than it would be for adults or, or geriatric patients. Um, so when there's a lot of rapid growth, things happen as well. Um, and you're also looking at growth hormone um, is a factor there. And children have, I mean, they have, as they get to a certain age, they have more, it's more calcium. So the bones can also be, be stronger, which is why when we see broken bones, it's, it's a red flag. Um, so you guys can look at that. I'm trying to get to the uh, pictures. So diagnostic and lab tests, because this was one of the objectives. So uh, different lab work, CBC, um, the CRP that keeps coming back around, right? In adults and in children looking at, at infection or inflammation, right? That's what we're looking at as a sign of inflammation, as well as the SED rate, the ESR. That's another one that is used to, um, to indicate inflammation. Uh, alkaline phosphatase um, can be elevated when there is, um, when there could be fractures or trauma. One of the things we see in teenagers is an elevated Alk phosphatase. And why would that be? Well, when are they growing? When are these growth spurts, right? You're going to see an elevated alk phosphate, alk phosphatase when there's a growth spurt. So that's, that's would be expected. Um, looking at calcium and, the, and phosphorus, the relationship between that. Um, there's also creatinine um, phosphokinase. I don't think we look at that as much in kids, but in, in adults. And then um, we are not covering arthritis right now or rheumatoid or juvenile arthritis that will get covered in third semester. But just to know that there is something called rheumatoid factor. Um, so if there is rheumatoid arthritis, you would see a positive um, rheumatoid factor with also the increased CRP and SED rate. Um, and that would be a clue that there's possibly some the arthritis in a child. And then your basic you know, CTs, x-rays, MRIs, those type of, um, of diagnostics. And then um, we talked about osteogenesis imperfecta, different types of fractures from trauma. Um, and that's where safety, right? The concept of safety uh, it comes uh, to be so important and wearing seatbelts and wearing helmets and um, being careful. <laughs> also, and you also see, unfortunately see it in child abuse as well. So uh, soft tissues, right? Rice, 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 rest, ice, compression, elevation, um, supporting it, a couple different um, acronyms there. Different immobilizing devices, so traction, different tractions that are used. Um, osteomyelitis, so that's a complication. That's an infection um, of the bone. And so uh, if you have skeletal traction where you've got the pins, it can actually, the infection could go into the bone. And, um, and that's not fun at all. I love his smile though. And that, what he's holding on to, that's the trapeze device to help lift or reposition them in bed. Um, this one actually looks kind of scary. This is an external fixator, an immobilization device. Um, uh, it's called, another name is an Elizarov. We also use these a lot at Shriners for limb lengthenings. So if you had a, a child that had one limb that was shorter than the other, because the bone is growing, you, you start the external fixator at one length and then you can, I don't know if you can see, see here with the pins, this, this plate can move up so that it's, it's pulling traction, right? So it's actually helping the bone to grow. Does that make sense? Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Roberto is on a roll today. Um, <laughs> um, and um, <laughs> um, they're they're painful initially, but then um, the 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 kids get used to them. I with an adult, their bones not really growing, right? But with children, because they're growing, it's it's amazing. They can do these on on the. Um, on the forearms, they can do them on the legs as well. Uh, so it's it's really it looks kind of weird, but it's it's actually kind of cool to think that after so much time, the limb will have grown. 
Um, that's an old slide, sorry, but that's your five P's, right? The pallor, the pulse, paresthesias, pain. Ooh, one, two, three, four, five, right there. Paralysis, pain, perfusion, pallor, paresthesia. Um, pain, look, more five P's, hmm, probably a good thing to know. Um, and if there's pain or the burning sensation, that could be ischemia. And so what they'll do oftentimes for a, in a, for a cast is they'll split the cast um, so that it, it gives some room uh, so the circulation is not cut off because we don't want to lose limbs. That's not a good thing. Uh, again, I'm not going into too much detail because you're going to get this um, also in third, mostly in third semester, but I wanted at least to have, you know, the, the terms or types of things for the concepts. Um, the different types of fractures, upper extremity fractures that you can have um, in the arms. There's also um, a spiral fracture, and that would be if the limb was twisted, and that would be, especially in young children, um, a sign of abuse, because it's one thing to fall and break something, but it's another to actually have it, have it twisted, and you, you, it actually isn't a clean break. It's a, that's why they call it spiral. Um, and so you can do closed or open reductions. Do you guys know the difference? What's a, what would a closed reduction be? Is that one at the inside? Mm hmm Yep. And then open would be when you, when you would do the, um, the surgery. Um, and so once it's aligned, right, it has to be protected. And so that's why you're using a splint or the traction or the fixator to keep it, once you've repositioned it, to keep it in the correct position. You'd want to go least invasive, of course, first, but if that's not an option, then you would do the, sur the surgery. Um, again, your assessment piece, right? Your CSM and temperature, I have to add the T now, um, you know, showing x-rays. So here you go, you're in a, a spica cast, you're flat. So we talked about mobility, but what else? Complications. How about pneumonia, right? From not being able to move for, for that type of cast, right? Not being able to move. Um, DVTs, right? We've talked about DVTs and emboli, uh, fat embolus, um, hypox yeah, hypoxemia. That's, you know, you're gonna have some infiltrates. So what are we going to do to help not get pneumonia in somebody that's immobile? Incentive spirometer. Incentive spirometer. Coughing and deep breathing. Coughing and deep breathing, right, nice. Uh, we kind of, you guys, I think know this by heart now, different consequences of immobility. Um, pressure injury, constipation, right? So oxygenation, elimination, uh, musculoskeletal, skin integrity. Right, it, it immobility really can affect everything. Um, consequences of immobility, right? We just did that growth and development. So think about growth and development. The child that is in uh, the hospital in traction, um, where are they gonna, going to be growth and develop? Right, they're not going to have necessarily their peers with them. They're not may or may not be in school. That's why I like the children's hospitals because children's hospitals specifically will have school uh, activities for them. Um, but for long, long hospitalizations, the, the development um, and potentially the growth, right, can be delayed. Um, and then the ones in um, blue are sort of the ones um, are the exemplars that you probably be seeing um, on NCLEX, uh, scoliosis, the dysplasia, which we talked about, and the club foot, which we talked about already. Um, scoliosis is the curvature of the spine. Um, and so this talks a little bit about that. It shows you the different, um, so scoliosis is the sideways, lordosis is in, and kyphosis is the, like the, what do they call it? The widow's hump, the old lady's hump. You know, you see that, that picture sometimes. Um, and so this is, this was a test question. Wasn't this a test question someplace? I see, I feel like this was a test question. When do you screen? You screen for scoliosis in, in uh, adolescence. Right. Um, 
So girls are screened. It's more common, I believe, in girls. Um, but you're you're taking X-rays. You actually have the person bend over at the at the waist, and you should be able to see if there's any curving of the spine sideways. And then um, they can go for X-rays, um, referrals to orthopedists. Um, there can be non-surgical interventions. They'll put you in a um, the Milwaukee brace is specifically for. Um, for scoliosis, the TLSO is a um, thoracic lumbar sacral orthosis. So that would be, again, a brace that goes around those all the way down to the sacrum to keep the spine um, in line. Um, I talked about rod, rod placement a little bit. Um, at Shriners, they do that. They'll put literally rods in on either side of the spine to keep the spine aligned. Um, they also used to do fusions. I they probably still do spinal fusion. So you're going to fuse the vertebrae in the correct position. Um, you can either go in posteriorly or anteriorly on that. Um, but those 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 kids are in the hospital for at least a week or two with that, and then all the rehab that would happen after that as well. Um, and so we talked. We covered dysplasia of the hip. Um, Another picture of an actual baby with a pavlic harness. Oh, I know one of the other things that you can do for um, the babies, if it's a mild um, hip dysplasia is what's called double diapering. Has anybody heard of double diapering? Right, because you put when you put the one diaper on, they can still kind of move their legs a little bit, but if you put two diapers on, um, then it, it sort of helps to keep the, uh, the, the legs and that, the hips in that, um, in that position. So that's another, um, another way to sort of help, depending on how severe it is, to help with that um, positioning to keep it that way. And then here's a child in a hip spica cast. Um, and so they've, um, right? So that one is, uh, she's checking pulses on that, which we can do, which is nice. If you have a cast that's over uh, the foot, then you're not going to be able to check pedal pulses. So you're gonna to have to look at toes and cap refill and temperature. Um, and then this is, <clears throat> excuse me, a car seat that can accommodate um, that. I, this is an older picture, um, but they do have, we had some babies go home in, in car beds. Um, uh, my friend had twins and they, they went home because they were preemies and they didn't, if you don't pass the car seat test where you have to sit in the car seat and they check the, um, the O2 set and the heart rate, you can get car seat beds. And so this is a car seat harness um, that can help because you have to get the child home somehow. And so this would be a way to accomplish that. Um, we kind of talked about like care of it and you're not gonna bathe them if they're in a spica cast, obviously. And then club foot, here's a, it can be one-sided or bilateral, unilateral or bilateral and seen uh, more in males, although not necessarily, uh, two to one. Um, oh, this one already has the, the answer, um, but you, this is a good question. You guys can figure this one out. Um, when, you, when you have a 10 year old, right? Sustained a fracture at an epi epiphyseal plate. An epiphyseal plate is the growth plate, right? So that's where the bones are growing, right? So when she fell off her pony, when talking, when discussing the injury with the parents, what would we consider telling them? So the bone growth can be affected by this type of fracture because it's at the growth plate, right? And if that breaks, that's a, that's a problem. Um, okay. Any questions on, um, on any of that? You have all those resources for you. Let me go back and look at one thing. Questions on, on any of that. Does that, you know, in, in terms of the mobility and being able to care uh, for the, you know, assessing is huge, right? You can see being able to do the assessments. Um, so what are some things that you can, in terms of discharge planning or things that you'd be like how to, like nowadays, I guess we're all on Zoom, right? So if you're a child like this, everybody's on, on Zoom anyway, but how, what would it be like, or how, what would you, um, how could you help the parent prepare um, the child to, for example, um, any kind of cast going back to school, or if it's a, um, 
You guys know about individualized education plans? I don't know if anybody wants to speak to that. I know I'm sure we have several people who have either were on themselves or have children on IEPs, like what that process is like. It's a long process where the teacher, the principal, the you know speech pathologist or physical therapist, whoever's involved, um, depending on the child's needs, um, you know, works together and collaborates and makes up a plan to best fit the child's needs and outcomes to ensure their, you know, development and learning. Mm -hmm. And so it really is a good example if it's done correctly. <laughs> Um, of care coordination because the parent is involved. Um, as my children got older, they came to their own IEP meetings to advocate for themselves, especially my, my third one with his vision disability. Um, and uh, they can, you can have behavioral, you can have um, uh, intellectual, you know, develop and de all different types of IEPs depending on what the, um, the, the gap, the disability is. Um, unfortunately, like Shannon's saying, there's a lot of paperwork um, and certain, maybe certain qualifications. Once the IEP is put in place, the school district must um, must follow it. Um, and but you know, the parent needs to to be checking in. I always think the parent. I can't just say, oh well, the school is in charge of my kid now because it's my child, right? So I'm. I was very involved with my my three children. Um, yeah, the behavioral ones are really difficult to do. Um, uh, discontinue the care? Oh, the hardest thing to is to discontinue the care. Um, I think it, when they start to improve, right, I gotcha. Um, because even though it's been identified in the, in the care plan, if you will, the education plan, um, when they start to improve, sometimes they, they don't, the school doesn't necessarily want to have them complete the, the IEP, right, and get them back into it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we actually had one with my son that was a, a behavioral one. Um, he had some anger issues. He was actually in regular classes, but he would he got to a point where he would become aware when he was kind of going to start to get out of control and he would go to the special ed classroom at that point. He had permission to raise his hand, leave his general ed classroom and go to the special ed classroom and hang out there with the special ed teacher who really knew how to interact with him, but he was also in the talented and gifted program because his, he was, you know, ahead in, in that perspective. So, um, so many different things, uh, happening with that. Um, and again, you're looking at, um, as much of, as much independence, even with children, as much independence, right. As they can, as they can have, uh, is always the goal. Um, what about, um, so hospital, we talked about school. What about plans of care for, um, for example, being in the community or if you were taking your child, you know, out and about, uh, which probably wouldn't happen much now with COVID, but um, what are considerations to get from inside the, ho the home, right? To be able to go out, maybe with a, a, a client with cerebral palsy, for example. Like mobility and accessibility, depending on where you're going. For yeah, can you think of some examples? You're spot on. Yeah, so like I'm um, trying to like if there's ramps, if your child's in a wheelchair, or if they use maybe um, canes, like the dual canes, can they get into the business? Do they have a bathroom that's accessible either for the child to use the toilet or for the parent to kind of help lay them down and change them if they're using diapers? Um, are there like long walks? from the parking lot? Are there handicapped spaces? Um, stuff like that. Like, are the aisles going to be wide enough? Like I know when I went to my physical therapist, the bathrooms would not have been big enough to get a wheelchair in and would probably not have been big enough to do dual canes and let alone try and like change somebody. And so I was really shocked about that. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. I, I think as a society, we're doing better with that. I hope we're doing better with that um but exactly with the gate if you're you know if you're thinking about um we I had when I I don't know how old was I like 10 I was taking tap dancing lessons and we had a girl in the class that had scoliosis and she had the brace on 
right? But man, she could tap dance. It was, it was amazing. Like, I don't know why I didn't think she could. I was 10 at the time, but you know, her gait is altered. Um, what about um, like accessible sidewalks, right? You see that a lot where now they're, they're trying to take the curb away so that a wheelchair or it's more accessible. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Um, Right. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's so to be a parent, so um, uh, maybe a, a, van, a wheelchair accessible van. Right. I don't think I can I don't think I can just stick them in my VW bug. Right. I have to I need I might need, um, especially for a child with cerebral palsy or maybe if they're on a ventilator or something, if when you're going out, it's a big deal. The ramp into the, the van, the space for the wheelchair, locking it in like the. Um, the um, the school buses that have the wheelchair ramps and secu secure and being able to secure them. Um, Disneyland has gotten way more ADA friendly, a lot of laws in place now with new buildings and construction for disabilities, correct? That is true, um, which is a good thing. And so a lot of people are, you'll see a lot of buildings or places trying to make things more accessible or there are more um, ramps uh, that go around. Um, even like at, the, at my son's high school, um, yeah, the angle of the ramp, mm -hmm. right? Because you don't want it too steep. Yeah, my husband works in construction and the amount of like ADA laws that they have and have to go over and everything, it's absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. Right, and and some of the buildings are, are like I know um, it, we're, um, we have a, there's a condominium where I grew up and um, we still have that property, but it was built in like 1973. And we've had a couple people ask um, that have you know have wheelchairs. Uh, can we put a ramp in, or you know, can we flatten something out or put a ramp in? And uh, if we do that as a as a um, like a complex, right? Because there's like five buildings in the complex, then everything has to be made ADA accessible, which isn't a bad thing necessarily. But no way do we have the budget or the ability to do that. So it, it really bothers me when we say, well, you know, they knew this when they moved in. I'm like, yeah, but, you know, some people were here and then had an accident and now they're in a wheelchair. And so I, I get it. I have a hard time because I'm on the board, you know, when, we, when they turn things down like that. Because um, I really don't think we would be able to afford the ADA accommodations for the buildings for all five of them. Like that would be a huge special assessment for everybody but maybe that's the direction we're gonna to have to go eventually because it's not accessible. And it bugs me that it's not accessible. I didn't know there were that many rules and regulations. Um, okay, and we talked about members and healthcare teams. We talked about the tendon lengthening, um, talked about various communities. Oh, pharmacology. Um, so we talked a little bit about um, baclofen. Um, there's some other um, anti, Spasmodics that might help. Um, what other, especially maybe for the, the patient with cerebral palsy, what other classification of medications might they be taking? If they had some anoxia. Would it be like anti-seizure meds? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, Kepra, um, Tegretol is sort of an older one, but Tegretol, it, uh, yeah. CNS depressants sometimes, sometimes antidepressants, not, right? Or um, some CNS depressants perhaps. Um, so there are different combinations. And a lot of times with, um, for example, like a baclofen pump. So that's actually, I wanna say I showed you pictures of that last semester, but I can't remember. Um, it's actually a little pump, kind of like an insulin pump, right? So except it's in the spinal, it's it's in the back and putting um, intrathecal baclofen into the um, into the um, the spinal cord. And so it, it um, relaxes it. Uh, and so you have to titrate that dose. Right, so there, it does take a while to find the right dose. Um, and the same thing for the seizure medications, right? You have to check levels, right? Did you guys do anti-epileptics? We're gonna talk anti-epileptics on Monday, but in farm, did you guys go over that? Like having to know what the therapeutic, okay, the therapeutic levels. Um, 
Antispasmodics, yes, definitely. Um, bowel and bladder ones, muscle ones, yes, definitely. And again, with children being careful that the dose matches with their weight. Um, we're not gonna do the case studies. Sorry, I'm gonna let you go here because it's Friday. But what I would suggest is looking at the case studies just to kind of familiarize yourselves um, if you'd be able to answer the question, right? Kind of like not a study guide, but um, it talks about developmental milestones and there were also a couple, here we go, here it is. This is what I was looking for. So baclofen, um, sometimes Valium, there's your Lamotrigine, the Lamictal, um, those would be medications that you would, that you would see. Um, and then, you know, be able to calculate a fluid requirement, um, right? So like, just kind of run through it and see what you, you know, if you can answer the questions, right? You don't have to, I'm just saying, it'd be a good exercise for you. To, uh, to do that on your own. And then, um, for example, the FLAC scale, right? Go back and read what your assessment was and what would you score them on um, the FLAC scale. And I can, I'll post the keys. I have the keys for these, I can post them. Um, and uh, yeah, and for example, the home schedule of 520 mLs of Pediasure from 10 to six. So what are you gonna set the pump? What's the pump rate? You know, do you, would you know how to set up? Remember the Mickey button? I had the little teddy bear. We had a little Mickey button, the little connectors. So that's kind of what that question's asking you. Um, and then um, this one is about uh, the femur um, and a head injury. And so again, looking at um, vital signs, the physician's orders, they've got morphine, the neurovascular checks. And then the one to look at on um, this one is, it's can you calculate the, the drug doses as a safe dose, um, you know, knowing how much you're going to draw up. Um, and so the assessment changes a little bit. There's a, a Glasgow Coma Scale uh, to look at, right? So just kind of go through those and see. And, and like I said, I'll post the, um, the key to see what your, um, you know, how you, if your thought process is, is on the right track. Does that work for everybody? Yeah? So it's there. Okay, any, any more questions? Anything? Getting thumbs up from people, yay. Uh, anything else? I'll have office hours later today. Um, and anything else? No, let me stop sharing. We good? All right, then I am going to stop recording.